Welcome back to CVM at Sunrise this rainy Monday morning. And we go to our Reset Jamaica segment. This morning, we speak about corruption. We have Robert Stevens, who is a managing director of Pragma Consultants. He recently wrote a letter to the editor where he offered his thoughts towards eliminating corruption in the public sector and is here to share those thoughts with us. And we also welcome to the conversation Professor Trevor Monroe of the National Integrity Action Jamaica, more importantly, St. George's College. But we, we, we'll <laughs> leave not, that. I noticed the blue. I noticed the blue. <laughs> uh, and, and I see the, the, the expression on Robert's face. because Well, he's I from, have my Monroe College. He, he's from another blue. <laughs> he has a maroon and I'm Woolmers, <laughs> but you know, so the maroon. <laughs> My wife is a Woolmers. Trevor, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't resist that one. But we're speaking about a serious topic. We're going to start with you, Robert. Um, the issue of corruption. Um, some people have described it as an epidemic. Some people have said it's a part of culturally who we are. Um, but increasingly, people are accepting it is inhibiting our national development. Mm -hmm. Your take on it? Well, I think one of the things that we have to do is we have to get away from this tribalism. What is happening is that every time a new government comes in, you get rid of all the members of the board of a major public sector organization. Mm -hmm. You throw away a lot of the plans as well, right? And you bring in a new set of people. All of the new people are appointed by the new government, and they are all recognized as mainly supporters of the government. So you don't have any continuity. You also have a situation where most of the things that were in train to happen have to be re-examined. So you have this period of lull. I mean, in the case of some major organizations, I was at the UDC, it took about six months for the board to be appointed. Right. And then when the board is appointed, the new board members have to be appraised of what the situation is and brought up to date. And then, so you lose like a year, mm -hmm. right? When there's practically nothing happening. And that's very, very sad because it, it, it affects productivity, it affects everything. In addition to that, what is happening is that because the board members are all new and you don't have that continuity, the, the learning curve is much longer and you also have a situation where there becomes a lot of tribalism. So, you know, people are looking out for the people who supported them to be able to get some kind of contract or, you know, kind of break, mm -hmm. right? And it's, it's for a time now. Furthermore, you find that a lot of the CEOs and senior managers are replaced yeah. because you want to get the people of your complexion basically in, in power now and mm -hmm. in charge. So there are a lot of things that happen which are not good for continuity and for productivity and so on. So my recommendation is that you structure the boards in a way where you have a mix of the incoming government, the people who are going out, as well as civil society, mm -hmm. so that you get a better balance. Yeah, and the chairman, granted, may be selected by the government, but the persons who are on the board are not totally of the same political party. And therefore, you get a situation where there's more balance and there's more kind of, you know, looking at the pros and cons of things rather than which party it benefits. Right. For, you have a situation also where some of the boards are massive. Like I remember at one stage the UDC board was 23 members. Now, how do you control a board with 23 members? Hmm? Even if they're all thinking along the same lines, that's very difficult. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to limit it to a maximum of nine members. And that should be something that is established throughout the public sector. So, so maybe nine fixed members as a critical mass. And then because it, it's going to be hard, Trevor, for an incoming government to not be able to exercise the, the, the benefits of having won an election. Uh, Canada, for example, has done a thing where what were normally called permanent secretaries are now ascribed as deputy ministers and they are responsible for continuity and longevity and institutional thinking and direction and then the ministers can appoint um, I don't want to say peripheral members but a core set of members to the critical mass. What's your take on it? I think the suggestions are with merit but we need to put it in the context of your initial description of an epidemic. Mm -hmm. 
and so that no one believes that this epidemic is confined to Jamaica. We should recall that the United Nations in 2015 stated very clearly it's a global issue yeah. and they put it very bluntly. There is no sustainable development anywhere without coming to grips more effectively with all forms of bribery and corruption. And Jamaica has been trying, we've been doing, and in fact, in the last year or two, the indicators suggest that we are making progress. The Corruption Perception Index, which is a standard measure, but it has its own weaknesses, but it's used when we get bad news, we trumpet it. When we get good news, we kind of keep it quiet. <laughs> and last time, the 2017 CPI yeah. had Jamaica moving up 15 spaces from number 83 to number 68 and jumping up in score and we're in the top three countries of 180 right. in terms of the level of improvement and that had to do with institutional changes, the establishment of the Integrity Commission very recently, mm -hmm. the campaign finance regulations, the po political party registration and I think what we're discussing now would be a further step to strengthen the regulatory framework but I have to say that we've been talking about this since 2012 at least, where there's a corporate governance framework for the public sector. And by the way, we're talking about 191 different bodies disposing billions of dollars of taxpayers' money and earning very often big revenue for the government. For yeah. example, the Civil Aviation Authority, they have a surplus of $1.7 to $2 billion. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very crucial area. But from 2012 till now, Code of Ethics, to be drafted for conduct of these various boards and it's stated very clearly in the 20 principles that are set out one of them is that the composition of the board must be constituted in an open merit-based rigorous selection process yeah. of course the minister has and I agree fully with this the minister has the prerogative to choose the chairman of the board mm -hmm. so I think we need to start with enforcing what we already have as well as taking into account the kind of suggestions that Robert and yourself are making. And what we have is the Public Bodies Management and Accountability Act, right. which says that every year, within four months of the end of the financial year, the board is to present its report included auditing accounts. Do you know how many boards did that in the last numbers I looked at in 2016? Not they measured many. 163 mm -hmm. public boards. Points. 37 alone were in compliance. Right. And the law provides for sanctions and penalties. And if you know of any sanction applied to any board for failure to fulfill the law, tell me, I'd love to hear. <laughs> no, Robert, the Public Bodies Management and Accountabilities Act, when it was promulgated, did promise a lot of those stricter governance levels being operated. It specifies that directors can themselves individually be found liable at the time, I believe, mm -hmm. up to a million dollars or one year in jail. But it seems legislation alone doesn't. No, you quite need to implement job. and yeah. you need to ensure that when you talk about legislation, you have a body that is now going to say, okay, listen, are these bodies living up to what you expect mm -hmm. or not? The, one of the things that I noticed too is that you have a lot of public companies that are in the, you know, in the stock market. They make quarterly reports. They report on their financials and anything significant in terms of management, etc. Why can't we have public sector bodies and public agencies report in the same way every quarter? You know, they actually do make a report because I know for, I was at the UDC, so I know we make quarterly reports. But it goes to the minister. And what comes out is a press release about things that are very positive, <laughs> right? <laughs> but you pick and choose. What you want is something that is reporting on everything. What are your targets that you had? Did you achieve them? If not, why not? And let us begin to get some accountability. The transparency in the public sector is just not there. Right. And it should be at least up to the standard of the private sector. Hmm? This is public funds we're spending. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we are not going out there and saying, hey, this quarter we promised you this, we achieved it or we didn't achieve it, and if not, why not? And show your financials. Mm. A lot of public sector agencies are losing money. We need to begin to look at merging them with others that are clearly more effective and begin to reduce this burden of public sector agencies on, on the public purse. Right. Why is it that the law, Robert, you, you were there, 
which says, as, as Raymond reminds us, that if Section 3, which says report annually within a specific period of time, and the minister puts the report before Parliament, if that's not done, the Attorney General has the, if not the obligation, the right to take the person responsible to the courts, yeah. and a whole series of sanctions are set out. So it's not so much that we don't have rules, is that both in terms of the ethical foundations as well as the um, sanctions to be applied are inadequate in terms of implementation. Maybe in the Ministry of Implementation. Yeah. So then who would be else. implementing it? So if the sanctions are already there, whose job is it to now implement them? The Ministry of Finance is the oversight body. And, and okay. in fact, this discussion is so timely in your letter because I understand that even as we speak, the Ministry of Finance is reviewing uh, yet again, perhaps, but hopefully for the final time, the overall framework yeah. for the choice of boards and for the enforcement of sanctions where boards are not performing. Well. And hopefully this time we'll get it done because we have a Monroe College boy in charge. We were taught to be magnanimous. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good one. It's a good guy, Nigel. Yeah, is. Yeah, um, yeah. Let, let me ask, though, because when you look on the layers of steps that have been taken, because in addition to the need to report, you have the committees of parliament for which Jamaica scored big points uh, mm -hmm. in, within the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association for fixing certain select committees to be chaired by opposition members. Um, and then the reporting mm -hmm. that that requires sees a lot of the principal and accounting officers coming to the parliament uh, giving testimony before committees, and uh, those committees are, uh, you know, have some awesome powers Absolutely. to back them up. Are those systems working? A no. huge innovation by Prime Minister Bruce Golding yeah. at the time that the opposition should chair the committees. And there's an effort to reverse this for reasons that are unclear to me, which needs to be resisted. You know, I saw that report and just borrowed from number 45 and call it fake news. There could be no reasonable cause to be reversing mm -hmm. such an innovation, as you said at the time, for which Jamaica received a lot of applause. Yeah. Correct. So. And if we have done something right, why try to, try to change it yeah. now? The other thing is this, it's important that those committees meet regularly mm -hmm. and review the documents they're supposed mm -hmm. to review. Some of those committees have not been meeting regularly. That is true. And you have got to get them meeting regularly. And the chairman of those bodies need to be appointed very quickly and you get things moving. Right. Now, too many things have just backed up in the system and you're not getting those reports, you're not getting any action. Yeah. So I remember seeing reports coming to the committee um, of events that had happened uh, a decade before Precisely. and the, 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 the resultant effect of what happened a decade ago, you could see it as a feature mm -hmm. of the organization up until the time. And we know what to do with it, the, the manifesto of the current government in 2016 yeah. uh, in the section on governance, uh, then opposition leader, now prime minister committed mm -hmm. that within 30 days, their words, not mine, the reports of the Contractor General, the Auditor General, uh, the Integrity Commission, these will be discussed by the Parliament. Yeah. And that's an important step forward so that the parliamentarians then have to do the homework, mm -hmm. uh, which is, as you know, an issue. Sometimes <laughs> you come and you find that you get the, the thing at the same time, or you've gotten it before, but you don't read it. Yeah. They do the homework and then interrogate the issues and yeah. Uh, uh, discharge a public fun uh, function. And as you mentioned earlier, without that tribal or um, complexion bent, that I'm, I'm, you know, this is not a gotcha moment, mm -hmm. but this is a moment to advance the, um, cause Jamaica. Yeah, you know, look, let's put Jamaica first and stop putting the next five-year term first. The, the, I, you, which you, political you mentioned part? that. Um, I know Amashika wants to come in. Let me just address something quickly, because I saw it in your letter, um, and, and it's something we speak about, that when one administration comes in, they try to undo. Not so much, um, again, as it might have been in, say, the 70s and the 80s, but another thing has changed. We had a two-term experience. Mm -hmm. Then we had the four-term period, um, 89 to 2007. Mm -hmm. I spoke to some university students out west a few months ago, and they said it's their lived experience that 
every election brings a change of government since 2002. So in 2002, the PNP was elected. In 2007, the JLP. In 2011, the PNP. And in 2016, the JLP was elected. During that period as well, a lot of the major boards, like a JTB, with mm -hmm. which I'm very familiar, or a tourism enhancement fund specifies by statute the composition of the board. So it brings people from the sectors that um, abut with the Jamaica Tourist Board or the Tourism Enhancement Fund. Trevor, Robert, do we have the evidence, the information as to how those have operated in the real world to be able to guide a new governance framework? Or are we still guessing at it? Still guessing at it, but in some of the boards that I am familiar with, uh, the changes have been moderated in a fashion that allows some continuity. Right. So it's not, we're not broad brushing. In that there are many, as you point out, that work, I think, of the Civil Aviation Authority, mm -hmm. which is one of the big, big profit centers of the administration, successive ones. Yeah. And they have board changed, but there has been a level of continuity in policy and in programming, and that, that does redound to the benefit of everybody. And therefore, mm -hmm. we should use those best practices mm -hmm. to inform those boards that are lagging. And some of the notorious anecdotes about people who have performed, boards have done well, bureaucracy has been reduced, and then you look, the CEO and the board changes, and you wonder why. And in fact, reading Robert's letter, you don't have to wonder. Yeah, yeah Robert's letter was, um, one of those wake-up moments, as, as if we needed another wake a, a, another wake-up moment, yes. So then who is supposed to be advocating to keep persons accountable or to see these best practices continue? Who is it, the people? That's well, the my argument is that civil society needs to be there champing at the bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really, we need a lot more activists, if you will, in civil society. But both political parties need to also do their jobs well. Number one, if you're in government, mm -hmm. you want to perform well. Just if you're in opposition, what you want to do is make sure that the government is doing what they say they're going to do. To not stay. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> do those say. are the motivation. One yeah. wants to stay and one so, wants to yeah. not stay. Yeah. But you know, the, the, the coming together of everybody with a focus on Jamaica yeah. and let us move Jamaica forward is really where we need to be. There are so many things that are spinning around, you know. There are too many things that take so long to get done. We've been talking about Jamaica becoming the hub for distribution in the region to the world. Mm -hmm. From, I mean, I was at the Port Authority back in 2003 to 5, 6. Yeah. And, and we had the China-Caribbean trade fair. There were 40-odd companies from China ready to move to Jamaica then. Yeah. And we, we dropped right, the ball. Right, correct. And, mm -hmm. and Trevor, you remember right. Jamaica got favored nation oh, status absolutely. to facilitate that. Absolutely. The Chinese were willing to go to bed with mm -hmm. us yeah. then in terms of, A, setting us up as a distribution hub. And then what comes after that, you know, is that you become a manufacturing hub. Mm. Because clearly, China has a lot of quotation, um, co sorry, quotes, um, yeah, they, they have quotes where there are areas, they quotas they can't mm -hmm. go into, right. or they have limitations on exports. If you add 30% value added in Jamaica, you can stamp made, made in, in Jamaica, Jamaica. Yeah. and you yeah. can then export to the world. Mm -hmm. China saw that as an opportunity. They said, Jamaica, let's go to bed. We dropped the ball. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's important that we look at how we are located, not just physically, but geopolitically. We are very, very central to this entire region. Mm -hmm. We're at the center of the Americas, South America, Central America, North America. Let us utilize that advantage. Yeah. I think but your question moving. is then crucial in this regard. Mm -hmm. Who is to ensure that all the things that Robert has I, said I and we've been saying about, all and the in that good context, ideas. can I agree with you that in that the media has a fundamental role to play? We're now number six in the world of 180 countries in terms of freedom of the press. We're ahead of the United States, United Kingdom, Germany lagging behind us. We need to, when I say we know, the media folks, mm -hmm. as you are doing this morning, need to target much more uh, pointedly the kinds of issues that we're talking about, to inform public opinion, use the access to information, do the investigative journalism, find out how much ministers are spending on cell phones, as well as why it is, as in successive administration, right. as well as why it is that developmental projects of the sort that we're talking about 
don't get done. And in that context, also members of both sides of the house. These are not all people who have um, vile intent. There are very many good people on the government side, many good people on the opposition side and successive administrations. They need to stand up to those amongst their ranks yeah. who are self-interested at the expense of Jamaica's interests. Trevor, that would have to be the, the last words of this morning. Robert, I want to thank you uh, for making the journey here despite the weather. Same to you, Trevor. I have to tell you, oh, it, was, it was a journey. Was a journey. <laughs> <laughs> and to your viewers preparing to get out there, stay with us. We'll continue with the news when we come back from the break.